Yeah, so I'm yeah, I've been told Good. 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 All right, so let me uh, just make a couple of announcements, if you can put these on your calendar, uh, that would be awesome. Uh, I mean, obviously, you know, tonight, Wednesday, we do have service here, uh, 6 o'clock tonight, 7 o'clock Wednesday. Our uh, Bible conference in Santa Monica begins on Wednesday, so uh, some of us will be heading there. Uh, but Nate DeWitt will be preaching here Wednesday night, and I do want to encourage you to come and to tune in if you're watching, as uh, he always shares uh, something on his heart, and I know he's going to share a burden uh, on his own heart, so I want to encourage you to be here for that, and again, uh, just encourage you to lock in to what God's doing. Um, so again, be praying for our conference in uh, California. That God will help us there. Uh, also, next Sunday morning, Aaron's going to be ministering. And so, again, I encourage you to uh, just lock in. Uh, how many of you know that Jesus is here? Yes, sir. No matter who's preaching. And uh, so we come here for him. And so I do encourage you to uh, be a part of what God's doing here. And uh, then next Sunday night, if you can uh, just uh, note this, next Sunday night we're having church on the street, and so we're going to be going out to Davis Park and uh, working on a permit for that, uh, but even if we don't get a permit, we're going there. Uh, sometimes, uh, you, just, you can turn the phone off for a minute, no, I'm just kidding. We, we ask for forgiveness if we don't get permission. Uh, so uh, that's been our life so many times on the street uh, because honestly uh, the government loves us because we help the homeless situation we help the gang problem we help the drug problem uh, because we bring an answer and um, so uh, they just don't know it all the time and so they, they get slow on the permits sometimes um, but they really are for us I believe that and they, they want uh, they want people helped and uh, so we have the answer. So again, next Sunday night, 6 o'clock, uh, we're going to be uh, down uh, on the street. If you were with us last time, had a great time there. We're going to have some testimonies lined up. Uh, if you would like to share your testimony uh, there, uh, then just please let me know or let Aaron know. Uh, I'm actually not going to be there. Aaron is going to be and Nate are going to be running it, and also we'll have some other churches involved as well. So really excited. I really believe this uh, church, and, you know, I'm not a unity at all costs type of a pastor. I've never been that way. Unity, we just got to have unity. Throw away everything you believe, and uh, I'm not that. But I do believe that there is a unity that the world needs to see right now in the yes, church. Sir. Yes. Uh, there's a unity that people, the church has to get on the same page. Yes. Mm -hmm. And the, the page that we get on is it's called the Bible. Right. It's not called the nomination. It's not called right. your right. opinion or my opinion or the Bible opinion or the, or excuse me, the some preacher's opinion. Mm -hmm. It is the Bible. Right. We've got to get on the same page. I, I felt this probably a couple weeks ago when we were uh, downtown. I thought, we got, if, if the church can't get on the same page, how's the world going to get on our page? True, that's true. And so I know this has been a common problem throughout at least all the years of my salvation. Uh, but unity, we're in a season now uh, where we've got to get on the same page. And so, uh, and you know, churches have to stop being territorial. Right. Well, yeah, this is my, you know, these are, and I get it, we lock into a, a local church, and we're a part of that church, and, you know, we don't meet with other churches, so, oh, I'm going to go there now, and I'm going to, no, that's, that's, you got the wrong idea. You know, we, God calls us into specific bodies, right. but 
or into specific local bodies, but we come together as one body. Yeah. And so um, we really need to begin to pray into that. Uh, enough of the disunity, enough of the discord, enough mm -hmm. of the division. Mm -hmm. uh, again, for the sake of the world that's looking at, for they're looking for something. They don't know what they're looking for. You know, they're looking for a cure, right? That's right. They're looking for a leader. Uh, but the church uh, has to have a voice mm -hmm. in that. And so I want to encourage you, you know, anytime we're going to go down on the streets, I'm always reaching out to other pastors and saying, hey, we're going to be down there if you guys want to join us, if you don't have a Sunday night service. And so uh, I want to encourage you to uh, be a part of that. Last time I know it was a little cold and rain. Uh, I don't know what it's going to be like this Sunday night. Uh, but rain doesn't stop the devil That's from right. harassing people. It shouldn't stop God's people. Uh, if you can be out there, I'm, I'm not asking you to, you know, if it's you know snow and whatever. Well, maybe maybe we should. I don't know. Anyway, that's your call. I'm not going to tell you what to do. That's your call. Uh, but I do encourage you to at least be praying uh, for uh, very powerful things to happen. Amen. So listen, that's all the announcements I have. Uh, just please jot those things down. Nate is Nate with preaching this. Wednesday, Aaron next Sunday morning, and we're on the streets next Sunday night. And uh, just going to want to continue to do that. So I encourage you to be a part of that. Ushers, why don't you come? We're going to take our tithes and offerings uh, this morning. And I want to encourage you to continue uh, to believe God uh, to provide. Um, you know, in a season where people are afraid uh, for jobs and, uh, you know, and have been for a number of months now. Uh, let, you know, the church, I've seen it even here in our congregation, the church just rises above that and yeah. trust God anyway. Yeah. And so uh, I want to encourage you to trust God in, in all that he is doing, all that he has done. Let's bow our heads this morning. The Lord bless you uh, as you give. Uh, Francois, lift your voice. Bless the gift and giver. Father, Lord Jesus, we thank you today for this wonderful and beautiful glorious day. Father, we know it's from you, everything that is from you. Yes, Lord thank Jesus. you, Lord. Father, please, Father, in this season, because we have seasons not to, Lord Jesus, let us come together, Father. Let the church come together. Let your children come together, because we need you now more than ever, Father. We see what's moving, Father, in these seasons to come, Lord Jesus, and we know you have wonderful things in store for your children, Father. But let us not be afraid, Father, to go spread your love and your word and your glory. When we wake up each morning, Father, let us put our armor on, Lord Jesus, so we are ready for anything that this yes. world throws against us, that the enemy tries to throw against us, Father. Let us not be afraid of financial worries or personal worries or or, or or just physical worries, Father, let us just pray and give everything to you, Lord Jesus. And let us be willing to give, Lord, because you give us everything every single day, Father, more than what we ever ask for, more than what we ever need. So please, Father, just let us open our minds and our hearts to give, Father. Please bless the gift and the giver. In your mighty, wonderful name, I pray, Jesus. Amen. 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 God bless you as you give uh, this morning. Well, that's why as you were praying, a cup of coffee showed up on my There you go. <laughs> <laughs> um, glad you made it, everybody. Um, doctrine and teachings about God and about salvation uh, can all be given through instruction, through preaching, through teaching, but anointing cannot be taught. Anointing, God's presence, the open heavens that we're living under cannot be taught. And I taught on open heavens last Sunday morning. But it cannot be taught in the sense that we experience it as a teaching. We have to experience it as we walk under and walk in an open heaven. And as I was driving around this past week uh, working, uh, a number of things came at me. Uh, Mark chapter 8, uh, I don't know why. Uh, I wasn't reading Mark chapter 8, but I turned on my Bible, and as I was driving, wanted to listen to the Word, and Mark chapter 8 was there, so I just said, okay, I'm going to listen to Mark chapter 8 and see what Mark chapter 8 has to say, and, uh, not knowing that it's uh, over 50 verses, 
And I thought maybe it's something I can remember, you know. Uh, but it began with the feeding of the 4,000. It began with Jesus, uh, you know, preaching uh, the people. Uh, you know, there's something that we can learn from the people that listen. Uh, to Jesus teach they were out in the desert in the wilderness in a lonely place for three days listening to him teach they weren't eating they I don't know what they were drinking I don't know I don't know what was going on but all I know is at the end of three days Jesus looks at his disciples and says these people must be hungry And he said, what do you have? And they said, we have seven loaves of bread. And he blessed the seven loaves of bread. And it says that he fed all of those people. It's, it's interesting. We have another story of him feeding 5,000 on five loaves and a couple of fish. And here it said that he had seven loaves. And it said, and there were also a few fish there. So he takes the bread and the fish, and he blesses them. Listen, that's the anointing. That's the anointing. That's the blessing of God. That's the presence of God. It's not something, you can't teach that. You can't teach how much God wants to bless, how much he wants to use, how committed he is to meeting every one of our needs. It's an amazing scripture according to his riches and glory. So I began to read and, or listen. I, I don't read while I'm driving generally, but I was listening uh, while I was driving. Um, and it began with the feeding of the 4,000. And then the disciples get this. It's interesting. I told Kim, I said, I don't know how this could play in our church service, but it said that Jesus preached for three days. They listened. They were there. He, he looked at them, and he said they've got to be hungry. He fed them, and then immediately after he fed them, it says he sent them home. You know, I'm like, for me, I'd be like, okay, y'all eat, y'all eat now. Let's go again. Another three days. You know, but, but there's something about the blessing of the gospel. There's something about that message. And I, I don't know, again, how that's going to work in uh, to us as a congregation. If we just need to be able to eat together after each service and go home. If we need to have some, I don't know, break bread. I don't know. But it, it hit me, and I thought, Lord, you, you fed them spiritually, then you fed them physically, and then you sent them home to rest. And then, you know, the, I can't go into all the verses, but I want to I look at um, today uh, the issue of faith. I'm going to talk about Noah here in just a moment. But Psalms chapter 119, uh, three verses this week jumped out at me as I was... Uh, driving around. Psalms 119 verse 11. It says, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. You know, I preached a series about the word of God, the power of the word. I might revisit that series at some point. But I thought about this verse, and it seemed like to me, I thought, I, it seems like I've talked about this verse recently. Uh, but what I'm finding is that the, the more things are put on my heart, the more I find repeating myself. But here, uh, the psalmist is telling us, I want you to, I want us to get, if we, if we never got another verse out of the Bible, if we never understood another verse, out of the thousands of verses in the Bible, this verse, we need to get it. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. I mean, isn't that the goal? Isn't that kind of the, the object? You know, the idea? Isn't that the big idea? 
that we would walk in the power of the Spirit, cleansed by the blood, not sinning against God. And, and you know, not get it. We can all immediately say, well, we all sin and stumble, and the Bible says we stumble in many ways. But let me give you a verse that can maybe bring this in context for you, because immediately when I read this, uh, I see I have hidden your word in my heart. Uh, I have tucked it away. I have put it in a place uh, in my life. I've hidden it uh, so that no one can take it away. But then it says that I might not sin against you. And immediately, I think, isn't all sin against God? What is it talking about? And so I read Psalm chapter 19, verse 13. This has always been one of my favorite verses. We actually used to sing it in a song uh, back in, in when dinosaurs roamed the earth. Um, but it says, keep back your servant from willing sin. Let them not have, I don't know if this is how this translation reads, but the song says, let them not have dominion over me. Right. Then shall I be upright and innocent from great transgression. Keep back your servant from willing sin. Here's the issue. This is the issue. I've hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. And here the psalmist is telling us in Psalm 19, David is crying out, Lord, if there's anything that you keep me from, keep me from willfully disobeying you. Yes. Keep me from willfully, knowingly, yes. sinning, yes. disobeying, disregarding. See, that's what the Word of God does. You think, well, I can do that. I can. I, you can't do that. It's impossible for mankind to not willfully sin against God. Why? Because we, God, His character, He is so perfect, He is so upright, He is so righteous, that we do things that is willingly sinning against Him, but we don't even know it. Why? Because his word is not in us. Oh, wow. I have hidden your word in my heart. How important is his word? It is so important that it can keep you. It can empower you right. from sinning yeah. against him. You store up. Hiding his word in your heart keeps an awareness of his presence in your life. Yeah. Hiding his word in your heart keeps an awareness of his voice speaking to you. Right. Listen, I'm telling you, there's an awareness that we, God's people, must have in our lives that we are not asking God at any moment to, to go in the closet and hide so that we can do our own thing. There's got to be an awareness of God's presence, of God's voice, that is only cultivated by His Word. Mm -hmm. Psalm 119, verse 114. You are my refuge and my shield. Your Word is the source of my hope. Your Word is the river. Your Word is the wellspring. Your word, I'm telling you today, watching here in this building, if you are without hope, you are without the word. If there is a hopelessness in our generation, it is because there is a deficiency of God's word. If there is a hopelessness in the people of God, it is because there is an absence of his word. Psalm 119, verse 116. Hold me up or uphold me according to your word that I may live. And do not let me be ashamed of my hope. 
I think this is such an interesting verse. He says, Lord, uphold me. Hold me up. According to your word. That I may live. It's very simple, beloved. He speaks, I live. He speaks, I live. There's so much reserve in his word. It's not only the source of my hope. Hear this psalmist. I think it's interesting. I did look up the word. I'll tell you what it means in a minute. But he says, let me not be ashamed of my hope. You know what that word hope literally means? Let me not be ashamed of my expectation. Let me not feel ashamed for expecting you to use my life. Let me not feel ashamed when others criticize me for radically serving you. Let me not feel ashamed when I believe for the impossible, when I want to live a lifestyle of the miraculous, when I want to live under open heavens and believe that I can hear the voice of the Father at any moment, at any time, anywhere I go. Yes. Let me not feel ashamed of that expectation. Yes. See, all of these things take you and I just with a simple faith. You know, especially in, in you know, again, times like you, you need faith. Like, we're going to read Noah. Here's Noah in the Word of God. God tells Noah, I'm going to flood the earth, right? How many of you have heard about the story of Noah? <laughs> what do you think about when you hear about Noah? The ark. It's so on the flood. The flood and the ark go together. It's called the fark. <laughs> See, Noah was in a place, and this is where we find the tension. He was in a place where he had to believe God. Yes. We do not like that place. No. We like to know answers. We like to know direction. We like we would like to know what's going to happen tomorrow. Right. We would like that. But we wouldn't need faith. We wouldn't need to believe. And faith simply means maybe you're in a situation right now, whether it's physically, emotionally, uh, relationally, uh, whether it's financially, or any of the other leads. Right? You have to believe God. Maybe you failed. Maybe you've fallen short, uh, you've sinned, you've walked away, you need to come back to his grace. Uh, his arms are wide open, by the way. Hallelujah. If you want to come back, you are welcome today, baby. Okay. You are welcome to come back. But maybe you need that in your life. You must believe. You must have faith. Yes. You know what's amazing is God has never failed. He has never walked away. Mm -hmm. He has never left anyone down. People go, well, what about, yeah, that's because <laughs> they wanted God to answer them in the way they wanted God that's to right. answer yes. them. Right. But he said, no, I've got another answer. And they saw it, well, God let me down. No, you, you just need to hear God. See, again, it's his word in us that bears witness with what he's doing through us. <coughs> you know, the lesson of Noah gives us the faithfulness of his work, the promise of the word, and just how flexible God is in working his grace on the earth. Let me give you a couple facts about Noah uh, some of you know these. I've mentioned these before in a time past, but I want to just mention them again. Uh, if you don't know this, it took Noah about 70 years to build the ark. Wow. If you didn't know this, by the way, uh, some scholars actually believe, based on Scripture, that Noah was between 10 and 14 feet tall. 
See, we have no life. That's how we read the Bible. We read it through our filter. Like he just, he's just like us. Well, you know, some, a lot of scholars believe that the Apostle Paul was four foot nine. Yeah. Wow. That's true. That's true. But when we have him like this big giant, right. you know, Samson, big muscles, most scholars believe that he was just a skinny guy anointed by God yeah. with supernatural strength. We have him as, you know, Tony Atlas when nobody remembers him. Uh, the Hulk. How about that? Is that yeah. Right. Yeah. It's, you know, but because we filter everything through modern day. Right. So here's Noah, you know, big man, building, on, building an ark for 70 years. Noah spent 364 days on the ark. He had three sons when he was 500 years old. So he started building the ark. It was, it was finished when he was 600 years old. So his sons had gotten married during somewhere between he was 500 and 600. <laughs> the ark was, I don't know any other way to say it, it was a football field and a half long. A football field and a half. So 150 yards. Let me just tell you this. He did not just build the ark for him and his, you know, that his family, his wife, his three sons, and Noah. He didn't build it. You know who he built it for? The world. That's right. Oh wow. Come on. See, God doesn't discriminate. God provides for the world. Yes, right. I better just leave it at that or I'm going to get in trouble. <laughs> One scholar uh, says that the ark uh, could have held up to 2.5 million sheep. That's how big the ark is. The ark didn't have a steering wheel because God was its guide. You know, the ark, I, you know, it's funny uh, that when uh, the, the church was formed, uh, in the New Testament, it's interesting that God didn't call the church the ark. Because that's exactly what the church is. The church is a place where God better lead. He better speak. He better guide. The, the ark is a safe place. The ark is a place where you can come uh, and, and, and be shielded from the ways of the world. You can be shielded from, you know, temptation. And you can be shielded from the floodwaters. This is a place of, of rest. This is a place, the church. Yeah. Yeah. That may not be your experience, but that's what the church should be. Right. Yeah. The ark. Noah, he died, he was a little bit older, but he died at 950 years old. You can do the math, that's 350 years after the flood. Wow. There's plenty of scripture on Noah. I think, the, I think the, the danger of Noah and Samson and Jonah and Daniel in the lion's den is that they become kid stories. Mm -hmm. And we miss the power of the truth in these stories, in these men's lives. <laughs> Daniel in the lion's den probably was more rated PG-13 than a cartoon. Right. But we miss, and I'm afraid that the, the truths and the power and, and, and the protection and, and the provision. 364 days on the ark. And Noah, his three sons, his wife, their wives, survived. No problem. God's supernatural provision. Genesis 6 through 9, you can read about Noah and his family. If you ask God, of course, we 
would say we recognize the ark or the flood when it comes to Noah. If you ask God what he thought about Noah, if he were to put Noah's life into words, he would probably use words like obedient, mm -hmm. faithful, mm -hmm. resilient, mm -hmm. righteous. The Bible does say he was a righteous herald or preacher of the word. A faith that moves God is a faith that believes God even though you haven't seen God. A faith that moves God is a faith that believes God even though you haven't seen God. See, Jesus told Thomas in John 20, verse 29, Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? But blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Listen, here's Jesus looking at Thomas uh, saying, look, you're believing me because you see me. You can touch me. You can speak eyeball to eyeball with me. But blessed are those yeah. who don't need that. Yeah. Yeah. Why are we a people that always want proof? You know, it's funny. These are, well, we found these coins over in Israel, and we found the city of Jericho, and we found the tomb. We know that it's real. Well, I knew it was real anyway. Yeah. I don't need you to discover anything else. I don't need archaeologists to go over and, you know, tell me that somehow now we know the Bible is true. We are people that desire proof. I think it's important for us to understand that we are not only, but that we are really only getting a snapshot of what Noah was dealing with in his generation. <coughs> it's just a quick picture of what Noah was dealing with. Hebrews 11, verse 7. By faith, Noah, being warned by God, concerning events as yet seen, in reverent fear, constructed an ark for saving his household. By this, he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. Watch this in Genesis chapter 6. You can read it on the screen beside me. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that, and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Mm -hmm. Think about this. Think about this. I, I tell, I tell, you know, we talk a chance, we, we, whoever's here in the conversation, we talk about the rapture. We talk about the Antichrist. We talk about the end times. Yeah. And one of the things that we need to realize, you think it's bad now? You think the world's bad now? You wait until the church is gone. You wait until there is no gospel influence on the earth. We are really then going to begin to see that the people, the intention of their hearts are wicked continually. I want to encourage you, do not, do not stick around for that. Amen. Don't stick around for that. Make sure your life is right with God. Stop playing games. Stop messing around. Stop backsliding in and out and in and oh, I'll go to church. Yeah, I will. No, I won't. You know, hey, listen, if you're going to watch online, then you need to watch and you need to get a hold of God and let him get a hold of you. Don't just watch it just to do the church thing. Listen, we don't want to come here and just do the church thing. When Jesus comes, we want to be ready. And here in Noah's day, it is so, it, it is so uh, much like what we're facing today. That's true. God is looking at the earth, uh, and it says that the that He saw wickedness, uh, that the intention of the thoughts of His heart of mankind was evil continually. 
Watch what it says. And the Lord regretted that he made man on the earth. And it grieved him to his heart. You know, you might think, well, you know, it grieved God because they weren't worshiping him. And they weren't, uh, you know, loving him. And their hearts were evil. No, it grieved him because their hearts were evil toward each other. See, we don't get this. We live where we live. We don't get evil continually. We don't understand what that means. You know, when people say, oh, there's, everybody's good. Everybody's good. You know, you know everybody's, you know, it's, it's, it, people don't get this reality that the hearts of man was evil continually. That's what it's like without the gospel. And God regretted. It, it grieved him. It hurt him. And he saw the way people were treating each other. So the Lord said, starting over. I'm starting over. I will blot out man whom I created from the face of the land. Man and animals, creeping birds, thing, creeping things and birds of the heavens. For I am sorry that I have made them. You hearing the heart of God here? But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his generation. Noah walked with God. And Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight, and the earth was filled with violence. I want to just talk about a couple of things. I want to, I want to talk about the release, because the Bible says, by faith, Noah was warned in a dream, or warned at least by God concerning the events that hadn't happened yet. And so in reverent fear, he made an ark to save his household. One of the mistakes, again, that people, that the church can fall into is we can think that God only chooses some to get saved and others not to get saved. That is called bad religion. Mm. Yep. It's bad religion. Yep. God doesn't choose some and not choose others. Right. That's why we go into the streets. That's why we go wherever we can to bring the gospel into all the world. Right. Isn't that the mandate? Right. All the world to preach the gospel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. See, Noah preached righteousness mm -hmm. his whole life. We say it was just for the period of the building of the ark, but most believe that Noah was a righteous man, and he lived righteously before God. He walked with God before God ever spoke to him about the ark. He walked with God before God ever said he was going to flood the earth. Noah kept himself clean in an unclean generation. It didn't matter what his friends were doing. It didn't matter what other couples were doing. It didn't matter how they were raising their kids. He was going to raise his kids in the, in the eyes of the Lord and right before God. Yeah. And for 75 years, he's building an ark. He's building a boat, right? He's building a boat mm -hmm. in a world where it has never rained. See, this is at the beginning of, of, of mankind. This is Genesis chapter 6. It had never rained on the earth. Never rained. And here Noah is saying God is going to flood the earth with rain. And they're looking at him like he's crazy. I mean, he is 500 years old. He probably didn't look all that, you know, you know, Hollywood. So they're probably looking at him, saying, you've been preaching the same thing for all these years, and now you're going to tell us that God's judging us. See, Noah didn't know that it would just be his family that day in the ark. 
He preached with passion. He lived with purity. But that ark was the peace of God in his own heart. God regretted making mankind. And yet he allowed Noah. Listen, God will, God will give everybody a season to repent. He'll give everybody a season to get it right. And to me, this is more about God's mercy than it is about God's judgment. For 70 plus years, Noah is building this ark. And, and you know, I was just reading uh, this morning that nowhere does it say that Noah built it by himself. He might have had other 10-foot helpers. <laughs> He might, you know, his sons, I don't know. Maybe they were pitching in. But for 70 plus years, as he's building the ark, people are, are, have an opportunity. Yeah. They have an opportunity to receive the mercy of God. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. What will it take? <laughs> First Peter 3.20, because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through the water. God patiently waited. See, this is about God's mercy. It's not about the flood. It's not about everybody dying. And you know that the word of God doesn't, you know, movie, you know, if you ever see any cartoons or movies about Noah, you know, this, you know, the people and they're, they're drowning in the flood and yada, yada. But listen, this is more about God's mercy. Yeah. He wants his mercy to be alive in us. He wants us to experience his mercy yeah. over our lives. Do not waste your time on the things of this world separated from God's mercy. And I read this, and I'm like, Noah, you know, I always thought it was a little longer. I always thought it was like 100 years. Because, you know, he started building, you know, at a certain time, and he ended when he was 600. So my math. But what they say is that he had about 75 years as he's building the ark, inviting people in. You know, but again, you know, a relationship with God cannot be taught. It has to be cultivated in your own heart. I can teach you to have a relationship with God. Others can teach you to pray. They can teach you even to read the Bible. You know, I love the you know, Bible studies that teach you how to read you know, systematically and break it down. And, but that you can know all that and still not know God. Are we building a life with God that can influence our culture? Are we building a life with God that can influence? And let me just say this. That ark did not have a lot of beauty that people would go, wow, I want to go to that church. I want to go to that ark. They got the best worship. They got the best children's church. They got the best preaching. They've got the best this. They've got the nicest that. You know, when people are desperate, they just go where their needs are met. You know, most of you probably drive by four, five, six, seven churches before you get here. And those churches are fine. They're good churches. But God has called you to a place. And God has met your need in a place. He has met you in a place. See, this is one of the reasons why our lives need to be lived out with God, even though we haven't seen him. Let me draw a quick contrast between Noah and Lot. Noah is building an ark, living righteous and preaching righteous. Lot lived a righteous life, but didn't preach righteousness. And his family didn't respect him for that. 
He, li he, he lived a righteous life. Peter actually says righteous lot. I've always wondered about that. I don't preach on that a lot because I'm a little confused about it, to be honest. <laughs> that lot lived in Sodom and Gomorrah, yet he was righteous. But the issue was he didn't minister righteousness. He didn't preach righteousness. How do we know that? Because when he went to tell his son-in-laws that God was going to judge this unrighteous city, his son-in-laws thought he was joking. They laughed in his face. So Lot went out and said to his sons-in-laws, sons-in-law, who were to marry his daughters, up, oh, get out of this place, for the Lord is about to destroy the city. But he seemed to his son-in-law to be joking. You know what this speaks to me is that Lot's son-in-laws were hearing this warning for the first time. They were hearing that Sodom and Gomorrah was a bad place for the first time. They watched Lot live there year after year, raise his daughters there, and even giving his daughters to be married to men that were raised up in Sodom and Gomorrah. What changed? What changed was God cared more about Lot's family than he did. See, God cares about families. God cares about the creation. God cares about those that he created to live and to reflect his glory. Yes. You may be living a godly life, but it is your life mixed with your message that will make a lasting impact. Yes. It is your life lived with a message preached, ministered. You don't have to have pastor in front of name to preach. Amen. Yeah, you just come down next Sunday on the street and you can preach. Right. Well, I want it good. Do it down there. That's right. Bring your message there. Listen, this is what this is what makes lasting impact is when our life lived and then our message ministered. That's such a radical plan with Noah. Noah's family followed him, not because of anything else but his life of righteousness. Yeah. Let me say this if you uh, don't hear anything else I say, listen to me. Your family hates hypocrisy. You say, what's hypocrisy? Saying one thing, doing another. Children can't handle hypocrisy. Children cannot handle it. They don't know how to make sense of it. Children, I'm telling you, children don't know how to make sense of watching their parents raise their hands in church and praise the Lord and then go home and cuss each other out. They don't know how to deal with that. That's called hypocrisy. Your friends don't respond to hypocrisy. God doesn't respond. So there was a release that happened of God's presence on the earth as Noah obeyed. Listen to me. There is a release that of God's presence on the earth that happened when Noah obeyed God and began to build that ark. God said, I am welcomed. I am welcomed on the earth by this even one man. I don't need the masses. I need the one. Yes. Is there one that will believe me? Is there one that will obey me? Is there one that will live radical for me? Is there one? Yeah. And we all know the one, the Billy Graham. You know, we all know the one, you know, the Reinhard Balky. We all know the one who rose up and said, I will obey. I will be faithful. I will commit my life, not just a month, a week, a year, three years. I will commit my life to this. Yes. See, and Noah 
by his obedience, and this is where I believe the church fits into this story, is by our obedience, by our faithfulness, there is a release of God's presence on the earth. He says, I am welcome. God is looking to and fro, the Bible says, to a people whose hearts are fully set on him. And he's looking so that he can reveal his presence. He can reveal the atmosphere of his anointing. But it takes a people of faith, a people that we don't need proof. We don't need all of the evidence. <laughs> you know, I love Josh McDowell's book, Evidence. That demands a verdict. Because, see, he made up his mind that God wasn't real. He made up his mind that God was a fake, that Jesus was a phony. But he was such an intellectual that he said, I have to find out for myself. And he flew to Israel and began to dig and do archaeology and begin to dig and find all of these things for him. He journaled all of it and he said, this is evidence. And you better make a choice. But see, we shouldn't be a people of evidence. We should be a people of faith. The Bible doesn't say that we walk by evidence. Yeah. We walk by faith. Right. We walk by faith. You haven't seen God use your life radically, but you can believe Him that He will. Yeah. You haven't seen God set you free or heal your physical body, but you can believe God that He will. See, it's believing a radical faith and open heaven that God is going to move. Amen. See, again, that the release is God's presence on the earth through the obedience of Noah, through the obedience of his people. Yes. I mean, God wants to express himself through his church. Let's talk about the unseen for a minute, being warned by God concerning events not yet seen. There were a lot of things Noah had not seen that God revealed to him. He'd never seen a flood. He'd never seen God's judgment. Some who study this carefully wonder if he had ever seen rain. He definitely had never seen a boat like this one that he was called to build. Why do we need all of the, you know, all of the answers up front? Why do we need all, why do we need the blueprint? We just got to see it. God just said, build it. I'll show you as you go. Amen. Just live your life. Obey me. I'll just show you as you go. Again, here's Noah. God speaks to him about things that had never happened. And Noah says, listen, he didn't even have anything. I've got the word on my tablet. I've got it on my phone. I've got Bibles in my house. I've got a Bible around here somewhere. Physical. He had nothing. Yeah. This is Genesis chapter 6. He didn't even have Genesis. <laughs> he didn't have nothing. We have everything. And the preacher still preaches like he's got to convince people. And we have everything. We have his word. We have the Messiah. We have the blood, the cross, Holy Ghost. We've got everything. See, the Bible says that God warned him. This word warn means to show or to exhibit or to teach. This wasn't just a short little chat that God had with Noah. But it was detailed instructions. And listen, if you read Genesis 6 through 9, you're going to see that God gave him very detailed instructions on building the ark, the dimensions of the ark. God knew exactly what he was going to do. Yeah. You know, again, Noah, Noah doesn't know. Listen, again, we don't don't skip ahead the Bible. Noah doesn't know that it's only going to be him and his family. He doesn't know. He's like, wow, we're building this thing. Man, we would be going to mass revival, man. Everybody getting saved. Man, this thing is massive, man. Woo, we're going to have a church service tonight. 
<laughs> well, in 75 years when I finish. We're going to have a church service. People are going to come and respond to the message of righteousness. 75 years later, no one responds. And God says, okay, just go get the animals. Animals don't argue. How did he get the animals? God did it for him, so don't worry about that. All of the animals come, fill up this ark, and then the Bible says that God shuts the door. God shut the door. What God told Noah was that he was going to judge the entire planet. And he told Noah, Noah, you're going to have to judge it too. You're going to have to make some judgments too. For your own sake, so that you don't fall into the temptations, that you're just a crazy man, mm -hmm. you know, believing some flood theory, some judgment idea, building some boat. You know, you're just building it for you and your family. You know, you just want to go camping every now and then. <laughs> no, you've got to judge some things yourself. So you didn't tell them that you have to judge the people. That's never our job. But you're going to have to judge some things. So that you don't fall into and your children. See, again, I believe personally that this was the reason. Again, this is a different story with Lot and his wife and his two daughters. But I believe this is one of the reasons that Lot, how many of you, Know the story of Lot and Sodom and Gomorrah. Lot, his wife, I know I know that this is, you know, just stay with me. Lot's wife turns back. You remember when, when she turned around and looked back at Sodom and Gomorrah? What happened to her? She turned into a pillar of salt, Chance. Yeah. You didn't know that, did you? No. Yeah. Here's Lot leading his wife and his daughters out of Sodom and Gomorrah. And this is just my own take on it, that she's looking at Lot. You can read the story. Lot had just given her daughters, his daughters, away, willingly was going to give them away to be abused by some men. I, I, I hope I don't lose you in this. But as they're running out of town, I think she's looking at him like, I can't follow this. You haven't judged this place our whole lives. And so I think she's looking back to see if there's anything left that she can go back to. Listen, if you don't judge the sin, the unrighteousness that's around us all the time, if you don't judge it, you will not influence those around you. Especially those closest to you. That's why we don't just give our kids anything they want. Let them watch anything they want. Let them have anything they want. We judge things. Now, we judge things as young parents that... Things, you know, I mean, we judged everything as young parents, didn't we? Just everything, man. No, 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 Ninja Turtles, no, no, no. <laughs> the devil. I mean, we judged everything. Can I be a Ninja Turtle for Halloween? We don't celebrate Halloween for one, and we still don't. Thank you, Jesus. That's right. But you cannot be a Ninja Turtle, they are of the devil. <laughs> Because we judge things. We still judge things. By the way, Harry Potter, demonic. Well, the witches and sorcerers. Witches and sorcerers, bad. Angels, good. Demons, bad. Harry Potter, bad. So we still judge things. But if you don't judge things, they will not judge things. This is why Noah's daughter, Lot's daughters, were so crazy. 
Got their dad drunk so that they could, you know. They were, they, they, here's the, here's the issue. He took them out of Sodom, but he didn't take Sodom out of them. And if you don't judge things, see, if you don't judge things that are around, then what's going to happen is it will get inside of those and your influence will be minimized. So that's what God told Noah. Noah, you're going to have to judge this too. And this becomes a problem when we believe uh, the unseen things that God has revealed to us in his word. And then we still won't judge for fear of being called intolerant or too judgmental. Right. Listen, God isn't telling Noah, again, to judge the people. That's God's business. But he is telling Noah, judge the corruption, judge the wickedness, judge the violence. Yeah. Interesting thought mentioned in verse 5. Every intention and thought of his heart was evil continually. This brings some insight to not just the actions of the people, but the intentions of the people. The Bible says that the intention of the heart was evil continually. Continually. Sunrise to sunset. They were continually. Uh, incredibly uh, to even think about that. This is why we need the Word of God to saturate our minds. Yes. For the Word of God is living and active, sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing the division of soul and spirit, joints and of marrow, discerning the thoughts and intentions of our heart. I'm telling you right now, everybody, listen, if you want to make it uh, in, and be aware of God's presence, uh, be an influence, uh, moving, and I believe God wants this for every Christian, not just people who preach, not just That's people right. who sing, but he wants the anointing to flow yes. through every one of his yes. children. Yes. Every one of us uh, is going to flow from his word in us. Yes. His word in us. As it flows out of us, it's going to influence those around us. Yeah. Yeah. See, this is the word of God that helps us. That's why I read those verses at the beginning that, God, I hide your word in my heart that I won't willingly sin. I won't willingly disobey. I may get blindsided. I may get caught off guard. But I will not willingly Walk away. I will not willingly disobey. I will not willingly sin. His word is our power. His word getting in us. I believe that we need to fall deeply, deeply in love with his word. This brings out the unseen, the faith in our lives. The ark didn't just represent judgment. The ark represented mercy. Yes. The ark represented salvation. Mm -hmm. Have you ever heard Christians are just too judgmental? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if that's because we are, <laughs> or if it's because of the word that the Bible, you know, is righteousness and the, the word of God is pure and, and the word of God speaks clear. I, I don't know why people feel that. But that should never be our intention. Yeah. Yeah. That we are judging people. Are we judging issues? You better. Yeah. Through the word of God. See the message of the ark is mercy. Yes. This here is a place where people can find mercy. Yes. The church is a place where people can find grace. This is the place, the ark. I think we just changed the name of our church. Is that all right? The ARK. <laughs> capital A, capital R, capital K. That's an acronym. Somebody, uh, you know, somebody find a name that we can, you know, we'll just change it all. The ark. It's what we are. Mm -hmm. We're, it's a place where people can find Jesus. Yeah. Amen. 
Amen. You know it's hard. You know it well, exactly. It is difficult in the world that we live in, in the workplace, uh, to find a Christian witness. I don't know how many of you work with believers. Uh, I don't meet a lot of believers when I'm out. Uh, oh, of course, I wear my John three sixteen mask, and you know everybody loves John three sixteen. You know, and so oh, I love your mask. I love your mask. Uh, but I don't know how much there's a Christian witness around us. It is difficult. Listen, the church has to be easy for people to come in and find Christ and find salvation and find love. The church has to be an atmosphere of God's presence that people can come in and not feel like an outcast. They can come in and feel like I'm at home. I'm here. I'm, I'm in. That's the ark. See, again, it's not just judgment, it is mercy. Yes. Every animal, all of his family had to enter through one door. One door, one door, one door. The giraffes, the elephants, the birds, one door. Salvation, one door. We can't change that. We don't have the right to change that. There are many methods. There's one message. And the message is about God's mercy. The message is about his love, his salvation. Please do not mistake Noah's Ark for God's judgment only. Yes, there was judgment, but yes, there was mercy. Let's be a people of mercy. Let's be a people that will just, listen, I get it. You look at some folks and it's like, can they really be saved? Can they really be helped? Can they really, you know, receive the Lord? Can they re are they even in their right mind? Listen, that is not our business. Our business isn't to cast that judgment. Our business is to go and give them the hope of Jesus Christ, the mercy, the ark. Come in and receive and be and be shielded. From the waves and the storms of, of this life. Amen. And even if the waves do hit you, listen, you have somebody to hold on to. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. This morning I close. Like Noah's generation, not everyone is going to realize their need for your message. No. But what mattered was that Noah realized it. Yeah. And he stayed faithful. He continued. He was steadfast. Yes. And at the end of the day, yeah, it was him, his three sons, his wife, and their wives. Mm -hmm. And the animals, two by two. Yeah. That was the end of the day. But listen, he didn't know that. Yeah. It's like, I'm going after everybody. Yeah. I'm just going to preach. And, I, and Listen, just give your life to this. Please don't make a three-month commitment. Don't make a three-year commitment. Just make your commitment. I am in this, as we say, I am in it to win it. I am here until I die. I am in this until I die. And I go to see Jesus. I am in this. I am not going anywhere. We need to make our choice, make our decision. See, this is what Noah did. Even though it was so radical what he was doing, he made a choice. I'm in this now. I ain't going nowhere. God said build the ark. I'm building. And I ain't stopping until he tells me to stop. See, we will re we'll release something when we do this. We will release something that is so, yes, it's unseen, but it's not unfelt. So I want to encourage you, live your life. This is amazing faith. <clears throat> this is amazing faith that Noah moved in. He walked in. He lived in. This is a mantle of faith that I encourage each of us to walk in. By faith, you are devoted to his will. By faith, you declare the message of righteousness to whoever will listen. Yeah. And listen, if they don't listen, keep keep preaching. Yeah. Keep
Keep going. Don't yeah. quit. Yeah. Keep doing what God has called us to do as, as His people. Keep it <laughs> Listen, hopefully this made some sense to you as I, again, driving around, just gathered some thoughts together. I wanted to try to communicate as much as I could. Uh, but anyway, we're going to pray uh, this morning. And I do pray that uh, you would allow God to minister to you. You would allow him to touch you this morning. He speaks, I live. You know, Jesus said this, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. He speaks, I live. Let's let him put some life in us today. Let's let him put some life. Yeah. Speak, Lord. Father, I thank you right now, God, for your presence, your grace. God, in this place, I pray that you would move and everyone watching, everyone sitting here. God, if we haven't made a choice to surrender fully to you, I pray that we would today. Lord, your word says that today is the day of salvation. I pray that you would move, God. We would surrender today. Move today, Lord, I pray. Maybe you're here and you want to rededicate your life to the Lord. Maybe you're watching. You want to rededicate your life to Jesus? I want you to slip your hand up, put it down just real quick so we can pray this morning all over this place. Slip your hand up. Yes, that's me. Pray for me. God bless you. Anyone else? Just quickly. Maybe you're watching. You want to receive the Lord. You want to rededicate your life. I want us to pray this morning. All over this assembly here, if that's you, you slip your hand up, put it down. Listen, you lifted your hands to pray. I want to, I want to pray this prayer with you. I want you to say, Jesus, thank you for your love for me. Thank you for your mercy in my life. I ask you to forgive me from sin. Live in me all the days of my life. Thank you, Jesus, that you gave it all so that I could live. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, I pray for God, everyone that prayed this prayer. I pray, Lord, that you would move, you would flood them, God. Let them know that they have just stepped into the ark of your salvation. God, I pray you would let them see it, God. Let them know it, Lord. Let them walk in it, God, all the days of their lives. Listen, you pray that prayer. I'm going to ask you in just a moment to come by the place to pray. Before we do that, I want to just encourage you this morning that maybe God is dealing with you dealing with your heart, dealing with your life, that you need to get your heart right and say, God, I want to be that witness. God, I want to be that influence. God, I want to experience your mercy in my life. We're going to open these altars up, up this morning. and I want to encourage you to come find a place to pray. Let God listen. If God's spoken to you throughout the message, you come to you, especially you that prayed, you that lifted your hand, I want you to come and pray at this altar as well. Maybe you can bring them up this morning. But I want to encourage you to come and pray. Let God minister to you as we worship this morning. Find a place to pray. Thank you. There's nothing worth Thank you, Jesus. Presence upon our lives, God, that 
Lord, we want to live in obedient lives. Lord, let us, God, I pray, every altar call, Lord, let there be a, a birthing, God, of your word, of the love of your word. In us, God, I pray. God, you do a work, Lord. This is a work that only you can do.
something that God has put in your heart, even when you were younger, that has been tucked away. It's almost like this radicalness that you've almost reserved. It's like it's, it's there, but it's like, should I move out in this? Should I not move move out in this? I don't know if this is making any sense. This is just what I'm getting. Yeah. But, but it's but it's almost been it's almost been bordered in. And um, and it, it's almost too like you you almost be, feel like you can't like be yourself like this this is who I am and um, but it's almost been um, the word that, that I'm looking for is like it's almost been pinned in where you don't feel like you can because of, of, of borders or, or things that have been put around you. But I, so I believe that more than anything, it's that radical that's going to attract others to you more than anything. You know, because you, you have all of the, you know, the giftings that are already flowing, you know, communication, you love people, you know, you want people to be helped and make it and all that. But there's something that that this generation needs in that, that area that God, I feel like God's going to bring alive in you again. So that when we were worshiping, that's what I felt like. That uh, that, that that whatever that is, I want you to really pray into that and really see what that is, because God's going to release something greater than you you've had, you know, on the campuses. But even in your own relationship, your own spirit, I know you're contending for that. Again, we we talked about that. You're wanting more, you know. But I really believe that there's something there that 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 God is wanting you to dig out again. Yeah. Yeah. So let's pray. Let's pray for Carly. Father, I thank you right now. Help me pray for her. Father, right now, God, minister this word. Minister, show her, God. Speak to her, show her. Show her, show her God, what this is, where this is, Lord. The anointing, God, the, the river, God, he, the river, God, even that has been untapped, God, thus far, God, I pray that, God, there, that this would begin to just flow out of her. Lord, the word I am getting is gushing out of her. Life. Greater than anything she's ever seen before. God, I pray right now that you would just show her, speak to her, God. Thank you. Yeah, amen. And Bonnie, you know what? I felt like just, I'm going to let everybody go here in just a second. Okay, I feel like that, um, that sometimes you wonder, am I really making a difference? And is my influence, is my influence really helping? And I really feel like God wants to just confirm that it is, that you need to just keep doing what you're doing, loving people. You, you feel like I want to. I'd like to do more. I would like to, you know. But you are who you are. You are where God. God's got you where He wants you. Amen. Thank you. And God. and so so I really yeah. So I really felt that and again as we were worshiping. It's like, I mean, you know how you know, when God speaks to you, you know, it's like. Mm -hmm. But I, I just wanted to. I felt like God wanted to encourage you that that you that influence it. Yeah, it is making a difference, and you don't have to question it. it it's making a difference. Uh, again, just let God use you where you're at. What you know, where you're at in life. I, th I okay. wondered exactly mm -hmm. what you okay. said. Okay. Really, I really okay. had it. Okay. I've been praying about this. Okay. Amen. Well, let's pray. Amen. Yes, Lord. Thank you for Bonnie. Lord, thank you for Johnny. Lord, thank you for this precious couple. God, I pray that Lord, you would just minister this word. God is only you can. God. It, it, your word that finds a place in our hearts and stays. I just pray that you would work, that you would move, that this word would 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 stay, Lord. It would it would begin to birth something even deeper and greater. God, I pray. I thank you, God, for the influence. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for how you're using it. Jesus. Jesus. Thank you. Thank you for your prayer. I appreciate it. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. We are uh, we're going to dismiss uh, this morning. I appreciate your time.
Uh, we're going to be back here at 6 o'clock. Um, you know, again, one of the things that I'm, I'm really trying to do, especially Sunday night and Wednesday night, I'm trying to uh, condense my message, really stay on like one thought so that we can leave here. If you remember, uh, you know, repent, be converted, be refreshed. Mm-hmm. Repent. Be, we just try to focus on these things and and really, really, so we can, you know, we're in a season, and, and the season has shifted, and I want us to to really receive all that God has in this season. So I want to encourage you to come, come Wednesday as well. Hear Brother Nate and what he's going to be ministering again. You know, uh, God's raising up people. God's raising up people in our midst. And I want to encourage you uh, uh, just to continue to pray, be a part of what God's doing here. So let's bow our heads. I love you. We'll keep you any longer. Lord bless you as you go from this place. Uh, uh, Nate DeWitt, you lift your voice. Uh, bless us as we go. Father God, Lord, we just come to you, Lord. And Lord, we just thank you, God, that we don't have to perform, God, for your love, Lord. God, your love is unconditional, God. And no matter where we're at, Lord, you love us, God, unconditionally, Lord. And we are thankful for that, God. I pray, God, that we'd be a people, God, who would just keep your word, God, hidden in our hearts, God, like the scripture says, Lord. I pray, God, that we'd be a people, God, who strive and have a burden, God, to lead others, God, to the world that never knew God, God. I pray, Lord, that that would just be our goal, Lord, to lead people to Jesus, the stairway that is connected to heaven, God. And I just thank you, God, for this word that was ministered to us, God, and I pray, Lord, that you would just take us safely from this place, God, and put it on our hearts, God, to come back here tomorrow. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 No, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it.